Welcome to the Science Salon Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. We post these conversations on average once a week as part of the larger mission of the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine, a 501c3 nonprofit educational organization devoted to promoting science and reason. As usual, we depend upon your support and appreciate your donations, which you can do through uh, numerous channels. We're on uh, PayPal and Patreon. You can go to skeptic.com slash donate and see all the different options there. And of course, we always uh, encourage you to just send us a check or call the office um, or any of the different avenues that are available there. And uh, I really appreciate your uh, support. We are a primarily membership uh, supported organization and uh, the podcast is our uh, latest project to um, try to uh, reach as many people as we can. My guest this week is a longtime friend and, and colleague David Sloan Wilson. His book uh, is called This View of Life, Completing the Darwinian Revolution. David is the Distinguished Professor of Biology and Anthropology at Binghamton University. His books include Evolution for Everyone, The Neighborhood Project, Does Altruism Exist?, and Darwin's Cathedral. He is the president of the Evolution Institute and editor-in-chief of its online magazine, This View of Life. I've known David for a long time. I always like his work because um, he looks for practical applications of science in general and evolutionary theory in particular, which he does definitely in this book. Our one beef of, of, uh, of uh, contention here that I push back on a little bit is his idea of group selection. Uh, Dawkins and Pinker and others are uh, pretty much reject group selection as a uh, factor in evolutionary history. David and uh, the other Wilson, uh, E.O. Wilson, uh, uh, think that group selection is real. So we do get into that a little bit, about three quarters of the way through the podcast. It's not that important. Personally, I don't have a big dog in that fight, uh, whether group selection is real or not. What do we mean by groups? Seems to be something of some confusion on how the language is used in this debate. Um, nevertheless, the idea that humans are a social primate species and group membership obviously plays a huge role in, in our evolutionary past. So we get into that, but more, much more importantly, uh, his work in, in terms of applying the ideas behind evolutionary theory to solving social problems, I think is really important. Um, and that's what we mainly focus on with his latest book. So with that, please uh, have a listen to David Sloan Wilson. Okay. David Sloan Wilson, nice to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Michael Shermer. We <laughs> go back a long way together. We do, yes. Actually, I've been a fan of your work for a long time, particularly because you're interested in uh, the evolutionary origins of religion. And of course, that's one of our bailiwicks. You're here to talk about your new book, This View of Life. As you see, I have a bound galley. We'll be releasing this the week it comes out. Hey, there's the nice, beautiful cover. All right. That looks much better. Um, so, but before we dive into the book, um, uh, for people that don't know you and your work, why don't you give us a little capsulated uh, background of how you got into evolutionary biology from wherever you're born and raised and, and how you uh, ended up in this, down this particular pathway. Okay, I'll make it quick, but um, my dad was a novelist, a famous one, Sloan Wilson, who wrote The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit in a Summer Place, so sometimes I think of myself as a novelist trapped inside the body of a scientist, and, uh, and some people say my science is fiction, so... Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, and, uh, but I love nature, always did, and uh, as soon as I, um, I decided, I, I, I learned that I could become a scientist who studies nature, in other words, an ecologist, then uh, that's what I wanted to do in my life. And that was at a time when evolutionary thinking was just spreading within biology. Uh, so now we think of ecology and evolution and behavior as a single fused uh, uh, field. Uh, but that only came together in the 1960s and the 1970s. That's when Dobjansky wrote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. That's when Ed Wilson wrote, sociobiology. Uh, that's when I was a graduate student. And so I, um, I was just lucky to be, to be present at an important moment in evolutionary thought. And uh, for some reason, perhaps my novelistic father, uh, applying evolution to the human condition 
was something that was just not threatening or frightening to me, but just enormously appealing to me. My dad studied the human condition through the lens of his own experience. I could study the human condition through the lens of evolutionary theory. So you might call me the first post-sociobiology generation. Post? Um, <laughs> We're past. Yeah. And, uh, that just brings to mind a, a dialogue I've been having with uh, uh, Jordan Peterson, whom I'm sure you're very familiar with, um, and what he means by the truth value of myths. So your father is a novelist, in a way is revealing certain truths about human nature through fiction, but his stories aren't true, true, like a scientist would, would write nonfiction. But that's not the point, whether the characters are, what, what is the truth we're talking about when we're talking about literary truths? It's along the lines of what you're talking about here. It's revealing something about human nature. And in a way, I think the novelists, going back to the, say, 19th, 18th and 19th century, were way ahead of evolutionary, evolutionary psychologists and sociobiologists. Yeah, well, this plunges us right into topics such as religion and, and what I like to call meaning systems. A meaning system is something which makes sense of your experience, basically. It's something that takes the information coming in and it results in action going out. And uh, the one thing you can say from an evolutionary perspective about our capacity for culture and our symbolic systems of all sorts is that what evolution does is it creates systems of meaning. And those systems are wise when they cause us to act appropriately. Um, that's very different than their truth content in a scientific sense of a word. Something might or might not be true factually. That's one criterion to judge them on. But what they cause us to do is a second criterion. And so when Peterson talks about the truth value of myth or the truth value of religion or the truth value of a novel, Take the Lord of the Rings, for example, a total fantasy, but the idea that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely is a truth. And it's conveyed through myth. So it's here where we begin to see wisdom in bodies of knowledge that are not necessarily scientifically true. And, and I think that that is an enlightened way to think about uh, um, non-scientific uh, bodies of knowledge, including religion, fiction, and worldviews of all sort. Uh, you might or might not be religious. You do have a meaning system. And if you don't, then you're, you're just not able to function at all. So uh, I think that these are all deep, deep issues that we've just plunged into at the very beginning of our conversation. Yeah, I think um, we, we often confuse or conflate or even collide this idea say, take the resurrection of Jesus, you know, did it really happen? You know, for many evangelicals, yes, I mean, they have to accept that it really happened. You know, there was a man named Jesus, he was crucified, and on the third day he was resurrected to heaven. Okay. Now, someone like Jordan, or perhaps yourself, might say, well, you know, it's true in the sense that it represents suffering, bearing your cross, being strong in the in the teeth of of adversity and hardship of life, that sort of thing. But I get the sense from most evangelicals I talk to, that's not the kind of truth they that, that's a, that's not enough for them. They want it to actually really be true. Like there really was somebody named Jesus who was crucified and resurrected. That's a kind of an authority, and I think that if you actually look at uh, at uh, religious believers, they themselves are diverse. And I think in some cases there is a need for that kind of belief in literal truth. For others, no. I think that they know, and whether they acknowledge it or not, they know that this is basically a great tradition. Its value is in how it organizes community and, and so on and so forth, but need not be true. In the same way that a novel need not be true. You might have a novel that's just like the most important thing in your life. It's, it's your guiding star right but it need not be it need not be true and i think curiously enough it's often people at the fringe of a religion that need it to be true in part because they don't have a lot of time to reflect upon it they might not be very well educated they need a kind of a short form which is the gospel truth right but uh, uh, but the leaders the one that spend their lives um uh, not just preaching it but but tinkering with it adjusting it to the situation they have to know what they're doing at some 
at some level. And so I think um, not all cases, but uh, many, many people that are uh, at the center of the religion are the ones that are most aware that uh, basically this is a human construction and they're they're among the ones constructing it mm. and it's okay in the same way that a great novelist can can be aware of um, aware of that and i know a lot of those i know a lot of those folks that are that are at the centers of their religion and and yet have that awareness well yeah and, and they're that they're the ones we're not worried about say uh, when we're concerned about the teaching of evolutionary biology in, in public schools and you know creationists want to you know have equal time because they they really feel like at least these this small group but vocal group uh, of fundamentalists that it has to literally be true i mean the earth is really less than ten thousand years old therefore there has to be something wrong with the radiometric dating and then pretty soon you're down some rabbit hole of how radiometric dating works and why the dates are not accurate or whatever and, and I, i'm guessing you would say they they are missing the point of what their religious meaning stories actually the truth value of them yeah for sure but i want to make two points uh first of all uh point number one is that uh, you don't want to mess lightly with somebody's meaning system um even if they're just like flagrantly counterfactual because after all this is what's enabling them to function as well or poorly as they do you don't want to disable it in others and you don't want others to disable it in you i'll give you an example i was in an inner city setting and there's this wonderful african-american woman who is deeply religious we were in a church and i was going on about believing in god and stuff like that and she brought me up short she said i don't believe in god i have a relationship with god she said <laughs> towering over me <laughs> and um well, i had to admire that and i have to i mean that's exactly what she had basically she had a person uh in the form of god or jesus and she had a relationship with that person and that relationship was very important motivating to her it was like the mainstream mainspring of how it caused her to behave and who am i to question that main uh spring we might want to in a long view but not in a short view so there's point one i mean this causes i think demands a certain kind of respect for um for uh, the many worldviews that are out there and a need to to work in a way which is collaborative in terms of what we all do together without questioning the mainsprings that cause us to want to do it that's when i'm working in real world settings i'm frequently working in churches with church people but we want to do things like you know a community garden or or an educational program or a, a city park or something like that that's what we're trying to do and as soon as we figure out that we're trustworthy that way then they're forgiving that i'm an atheist and a evolution <laughs> i don't even have to hide it and they don't have to hide the fact that they're religious at that point actually the conversation becomes more relaxed and open and people feel that they can actually question their doubts and things like that more than if you confronted them at the uh, at the beginning so yeah, like if, you, if you give somebody the choice between darwin and jesus and they're you know evangelical christians they're not picking darwin because there's no there's no worldview belief system for them in that well, although, I mean, when we get to my book, then I, I think that actually, um, really, I mean, the essence of my book is I'm, I, I want evolution to be a meaning system, a worldview, like a religion that way. Although, of course, in this case, it is fully respectful of the facts. So it's an interesting question is can, can um, evolution provide the kind of meaning system which is as powerful in terms of, in terms of, um uh, of um uh, uh, in in a spiritual sense basically animating is the word that i was uh, mm. looking for you know mm. capable of producing great excitement mm. and energy uh morale you might say mm. uh, and also informs what we do so i think in that case an evolutionary worldview would count as a secular religion 
that's something that's been like a holy grail for humanists for a long, long time. You go back to Spencer and Comte and the the um, the originators of uh, the Enlightenment and and uh, humanism. It was it was you know all always to form a kind of a religion of man, as they as they call it. Can we have a way of thinking that that actually motivates us and fully respects the facts of the world? Um, that's that's my goal, along with many other. Uh, humanist. How do you deal with the lack of the supernatural, the afterlife, the you know objective outside the system meaning uh, system that religion offers? Well, that led to my leads to my second point, which is that we're being too myopic when we focus on religion and make a big contrast between religion and other meaning systems, which count as non. Uh, non-religious. And I think the real distinction that needs to be made is factual beliefs and counterfactual beliefs. The stuff that's out there versus the stuff that's not out there. And when you ask the deep question, why is it that we're so prone to belief in stuff that's not out there? Uh, the answer is simple. It's on the basis of what they cause us to do. The most important fictions that we create and defend are the fictions that are important for uh, what they cause us to do. That's why we're so prone to believing in stuff that's not out there. But the stuff that's not out there just goes so far beyond supernatural agents. So much of what we believe, whether you're religious or not, is not out there on the basis of what they cause us to do. Let's think about our beliefs about ourselves. We all know that our beliefs about ourselves are very far from the way that we are. We all think that we're above average and all that. Most cultures invent glorious pasts for themselves. Um, their ancestors and their whole history as a people is something which becomes uh, um, uh, made up, uh, not out there, for the same reason that we invent gods. The degree to which our economic theories are made up of stuff that's not out there is shocking. <laughs> when you think of it. And as you know, there's a book called The Market is God by uh, mm -hmm. um, Har Harvey Cox, a theologian, that uh, elaborates on. That's funny, but it's also, it's also uh, a true. Now we have, we're awash in fake news because we've become so partisan that, uh, that basically we can say anything that supports our, our identity. And, um, and uh, no matter whether it's true or or not. So really, we should be focusing on on uh, the problem of adaptive uh, of fictions and the need to develop a worldview that could actually function as a worldview without resorting to adaptive fictions of all sorts. And that is, I think, the big question. When you focus on, on religion, you're implicitly assuming that it's only the religious folks that have these, that believes this stuff that's not out there, not anyone else. And that just ain't so. So that's why we have to broaden the view. I'm tired of talking about religion, to be honest. Hmm. I want to talk about meaning systems, hmm. all of them, and how we can create a meaning system which is, which really is more respectful of the facts than ever before, but still animates us. Well, David, if, if, if all religious people were like what you described, then th we wouldn't have a, a problem that we wouldn't have to talk about religion. But as you know, a great many religious people insist that their beliefs have to absolutely be true, and therefore the other belief systems or meaning systems are absolutely wrong, morally wrong, factually wrong, empirically wrong, whatever. And that's why we get these conflicts. So you end up with, say, someone like I was at a conference with Richard Dawkins and uh, Ken Miller. And as you know, Ken Miller, for people that don't know, he, he was one of the big debunkers of intelligent design creationism at the Dover trial. And he's a, a, a very well-renowned uh, for uh, microbiology, and that's that's who I learned what a bacterial flagellum is that was such the focus of Michael Behe's intelligent design theory. And uh, anyway, we were at this conference, and 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 uh, uh, Ken was talking about you know he's he's right down the line with you and Dawkins and everybody on evolutionary biology, and then he's a Catholic and he accepts Jesus as his savior. Jesus was re resurrected, so Dawkins says something like, "Okay, Ken, if we found a piece of the true cross." 
And on the true cross was a piece of flesh that was Jesus's flesh. What would its DNA be like? <laughs> so you'd have to have, you know, a half complement of DNA, whatever it would be. If you're born a virgin, you know, partho parthenogenic uh, DNA or something like that. And, you know, Ken's position was, you're missing the point. I'm not saying it's literally true. It's more, but I'm not quite sure what he means. He, he just means it's sort of mythically true in that kind of Jordan Peterson way. Um, and I think that's that's an example of, you know, Dawkins is a fighter. He's a bulldog for this because so many people on the other side insist it has to be true. Now, the Ken Millers of the world, are no, they don't cause conflict in the world because they're not taking it literally. So I loved your book, This View of Life. I think it's a, it's a Sagan-esque um, uh, it's kind of a spiritual or, or, or you know, kind of cosmic look at, at, at things, but I fear too many Christians are just going to go, yeah, but, 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 but where's Jesus in this book? I mean, I have to believe that there really was a Jesus who literally was resurrected and, and, and not offering a supernatural component is not going to do it for too many people. I wish it would. I, it, it would be great, but I, I, I'm not sure how to get to those people that still insist that there has to be that element. Well, that might or might not be true, Michael, but I think that uh, let's talk about the audience that um, the book is intended for. And uh, and I can describe a little bit the spirit of the book. Yeah, is, do, uh, yeah please. You know, what does it mean uh, to complete the Darwinian uh, revolution? What's that about? And so basically what I say, the way I begin the book is that, uh, of course, the Darwinian revolution is sort of complete for biology. That's why Dob Jansky could say nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution 50 years ago, well, 1973, whenever that, uh, um, whenever that was. And of course, there's still progress, always will be in biology. But uh, then uh, the point is, is that actually the word biology invokes a different meaning for most people than a word such as human or culture or policy. And so the claim of my book is that uh, is that the Darwinian revolution won't be complete until evolution makes sense of everything associated with the words human, culture, and policy, in addition to biology. And if you look at the people that are actually not there yet, it's not just literal or religious believers by any stretch of the imagination, nor is it people that are uncomfortable with the idea of social Darwinism, the idea that Darwin's theory led to all these horrible things, which, by the way, isn't true. We can talk about that. I have a chapter devoted to that, mm -hmm. as you know, as well. It includes people that are fully accepting of Darwin's theory of evolution uh, for biology, uh, but don't have a clue as to what it might mean for their lives or for psychology, or any academic discipline or any policy area at all. They have an article of faith, basically, that the way they think is consistent with Darwin's theory of evolution. But when you actually go to look, it turns out it ain't true at all. So this includes actually most <laughs> people, except for a vibrant community that you live within and I live within. Uh, that actually is doing for all of humanity, um, uh, thinking about all of humanity in the same way that evolutionary biologists uh, think about the rest of life. So that transition, um, the, the, the Darwinian revolution has been completed for a sizable community, uh, which is growing fast, but is still a tiny, tiny fraction of the academic community, not to speak of the policy community, not to speak of the great mass of humanity, regardless of whether they regard themselves as religious believers or not. And so if literal religious believers are among the last, then that's okay because there's so <laughs> many more people to convert. <laughs> Right. Well, I think you, you've identified one of the sources of pushback or lack of acceptance is that this belief that social Darwinism leads to eugenics and genocide, the Holocaust, and discrimination, racism, bigotry, and so on, as if these things didn't exist before Darwin. But, um, but, but I do think that the belief that that has been a problem has delayed the development of an evolutionary ethics and, and a social morality 
until the really the 1990s, 80s and 90s when it kind of came to fruition when sociobiology and then evolutionary psychology really got a toehold in academia and developed its own field. Why didn't this happen right after Darwin published uh, his Descent of Man? I mean, it, it was set up. It should have, we should have had another century of research on this. And, and I think that's in part one reason. The other reason, which you identify, well, maybe you didn't intend it this way, but you're, you're stating right off the bat here on uh, toward an evolutionary worldview, we need not just a theory that states what is, but a worldview that informs how we ought to act. Now, this is the argument I made in, in the moral arc, and I got a lot of pushback from, as you know, philosophers say, you can't do that. You can't go from is to ought. And then, of course, they throw out, you know, just because there is war doesn't mean there ought to be war. There is slavery. There ought to be slavery. How do you deal with the challenge that, the challenge that you're committing the naturalistic fallacy of trying to go from uh, is to ought? Yeah, I, it's a it's a good question, and you you've been a contributor, uh, and it it gets us to basically requires thinking about the whole nature of morality from an evolutionary perspective, and morality um, is inherently about um, the good of the group. Something counts as moral when it's for the benefit of some community, which is regarded as inside the moral circle. And it's regarded as immoral when um, when um, it's harmful to others or to the group as a whole outside the moral circle. This is so um, clear that it's almost axiomatic amongst moral philosophers, as strange as that might seem. I had the most wonderful conversation with Simon Blackburn, who's a moral philosopher in uh, in England. It's on my uh, online magazine, This View of Life. And I began the conversation by saying, Simon, uh, before we begin talking about morality from an evolutionary perspective, just define morality for me as you would in a philosophy 101 class. And he said, well, there's two sides to the morality coin. One side is coercive, basically. You're expected to behave a certain way. And if you don't, there'll be consequences. So that's the coercive side of the moral coin. But then there's a more voluntary side of the coin where we want to help people. We're genuinely altruistic, empathetic, sympathetic. We do it for its own um, end. And I love that definition because it's exactly what to expect, what we need to expect from an evolutionary perspective. This is a system, basically, it's a kind of a psychological architecture which causes us to um, uh, create norms. We know that norms are, hu are, are huge and in human life, norms of good behavior, punishment if you don't behave that way. And when those, when that side of a moral system is in, is in place, then it becomes safe to be genuinely altruistic. If you're in a strong moral system, you can be altruistic and you will not suffer uh, for it. So the coercive side is basically the, the, the altruistic punishment side that protects genuinely other oriented uh, behavior. So all of this, I think, means, to get to your point of the naturalistic fallacy, is that to be moral is to be behaving for the good of a specified uh, uh, a group. And what's good is, can be defined, for the most part, in biological terms, free from disease, free from harm, free from violence, so on and so forth. So there are moral universals. I think that um, it's it's that's a that's a legitimate conclusion to reach. Well, uh, of course, there's no morality on a desert island if you're by yourself. But if it's you and I on a desert island, there's no group. It's just you and I. I can act well, morally. A Michael, well, it's a little group. <laughs> two people are a group. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm glad you included uh, Blackburn's. Um, a definition here. I'll just read, read a portion of it because it, it clarifies your point. At its simplest, morality is a system whereby we put pressure on ourselves and others to conform to certain kinds of behavior. That's the side of morality which is perhaps most obvious. It's associated with rules, boundaries to conduct, and limits criminal behavior when the rules are transgressed. On top of that, there's an element of morality that concerns our sentiments and emotions. For example, our capacity to feel sympathy for each other's distress and a corresponding motivation to do something about it. So there are two sides to morality, one of them the more gentle and humane, the other more co coercive. Now, a challenge I get when I make an argument like that 
say from someone like Dinesh D'Souza, who's a, a Christian, is that, well, you're just acting morally, sympathy, empathy, or whatever. It's, it's just kind of a utilitarian calculus your brain is making. You don't really care for this other person you're helping. Uh, whereas with God outside looking in and he gave us somehow this, these moral sentiments, uh, it's real morality with that outside source uh, justifying it and knowing that you're acting a certain way. How do you get around the charge that it, 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 from a purely scientific point of view, you know, you sacrificing yourself for your brothers, you know, that's just kin selection. Are you sacrificing yourself for somebody who did something for you, reciprocal altruism? It's still just selfish utilitarian calculus in the in the moral agent's head well that is i mean that can be critiqued on a number of um um a number of uh, uh grounds it's kind of funny that uh and philosophers have said that i think that um that argument is like you know super weak and and um has been recognized as such for a long time take the current abuses of the catholic church for example um uh, priests abusing, sexually abusing uh, children. It will never be the case that the way I make an argument, that's what God, that's the way God wants it to be. We recognize that that's immoral, was always immoral. Now we're going to actually come down on it more. We're going to enforce that norm more than we did before. But to any, any uh, religious uh, group or leader that took something that was just frankly immoral on non-religious grounds, um, and said that God condones it. No, God is subservient. I mean, this is actually where God as a social construction becomes most uh, most clear. But another point to make, which I think is ironic, is that if you look at the origin of the word altruism by Auguste Comte in the 1860s, he invented that word as a contrast to religious ideology, which after all tries to get you to motivate, uh, tries to motivate your good behavior by promises such as everlasting life. I mean, so many religious motivations are selfish. Mm -hmm. If you do this, you'll have everlasting life. If you do this, then good, good, good things will come to you in this world and the next. And so the, the word altruism was coined as something that uh, Comte regarded as morally more pure than the than the religions invoked by, than the, than the uh, motives invoked by religious ideology, which, you know, frankly appeal to selfish motives. <laughs> when we get to uh, the, the question is, is there anything, any psychological motives which count as genuinely altruistic, which can't be rendered as selfish, then that's the work of uh, my, my, my great friend and colleague, Elliot Sober and I, um, in our book, Under Others, now written 20 years ago. Uh, tackled that question of psychological altruism in addition to altruism defined in terms of uh, of action. And the bottom line there is that if you think of, if you treat selfish motivations and other oriented pro-social motivations as just mechanisms that result in social strategies and we ask what would we expect to evolve, uh, there's excellent, excellent arguments for saying that genuinely altruistic motives um, can, uh, can win the Darwinian contest and so uh, um, uh, many of us most of us all of us some of the time are motivated uh, genuinely motivated to benefit others and the whole idea that everything must be selfish i think is uh, is a view that's um, it's been admittedly dominant over the last half century uh, but uh, it's time has come uh, i mean i think that uh, we really are on are are on our way to a more holistic view of of, uh, of uh, groups in general and so human social I think so. I, I, the way I come at it is that you can't fake being a, a good moral uh, person who really cares about others when in fact you're just being a utilitarian calculator using people because in time you'll leak emotions that signal to other moral agents that you're just manipulating them. In other words, the psychopath can get away with it for a while, but they're usually uh, sought out, found out, and then chased out. And um so like for example my wife can tell when i've done something nice for her just because i want something <laughs> or it's obligatory like oh crap today was valentine's day and i rush out and i get some crappy card she knows that i don't really feel it versus i leave her a little note when she didn't expect it and, and she likes that 
just because I feel it. So in, in other words, we evolved the capacity to detect cheating or, you know, shallowness or not real altruism versus the real kind. Yeah, well, I did a part of the work I did when I started to take these ideas and put them in real world settings was uh, I worked with my uh, public school uh, superintendent. We gave a survey that measured prosociality in all of the public school students. And it was a simple survey. It was asked, you know, straightforward questions like, I think it's important to help other people, things like that. Um, you could ask how accurate it is, and we tested how accurate it was. But the point is, is we got our bell-shaped curve, and um, and then we looked to see what kind of social support they got. So the, the basic prediction is, is that um, uh, someone who behaves altruistically, someone who just gives, 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 they can succeed to the extent that they surround themselves with other givers. So they're not greedy, they're not trying to get, but if they're surrounded by other givers, then that's what can keep uh, highly pro-social people in the game, basically. So you need to have a correlation between how pro-social you are and how pro-social your social environment is. And all theories of social evolution are based on that. Kin selection, reciprocity, group selection, they all work when they do by those who give also get, matching the givers with uh, each other, clustering the givers. And in our study in the city of Binghamton, we, just, we, we, we demonstrated an amazingly high correlated, uh, correlation between, between giving at the individual level and getting at the social level. Those who did give got from their families, from their neighborhoods, from their churches, from their schools, from their extracurricular activities. There was a correlation of like 0.7 hmm. between what you give and what you um, what you got. And I'm reminded of the great book by Adam Grant. You probably know about it, Give and Take. Mm -hmm. Do you know that book? Mm -hmm. So it's about the business world. And he, he, he identifies three social strategies. Uh, the givers, they give, give, give. The takers, they take, take, take. The matchers, they only give when they know that they're going to get in return. And Adam asks, who do you think does best in the business world? And the surprising answer is, the givers do both the best and the worst. Mm. And they, when, they, when, they, when they surround themselves with other givers, it's spectacular. But when they get surrounded by takers, then they become chumps and doormats. And he illustrates that with many, many examples from the, from the business uh, world. So at the end of the day, it's easy to explain how giving, prosociality, doing things for others and for your group, can be maintained in a Darwinian uh, world, uh, but, the, but special conditions are required. And when those conditions aren't met, then the takers take over. Then things fall apart. Then we live in a dysfunctional world. And so what this means is it becomes a, a blueprint or a compass, you might say. We now actually, we know what to do in order to make the world a better place, but it requires managing uh, cultural evolutionary processes. So uh, again and again in my book, I say that left unmanaged evolution takes us where we don't want to go. It results in evolution, cultural evolution will always be taking place and also personal evolution will be taking place, but left and unmanaged, it will result in outcomes which are not aligned with our normative goals. So the whole challenge is to create social environments that align evolutionary forces with our normative goals. It seems to me that, you know, take something like uh, Dawkins' famous line from the selfish gene that, uh, I forget the exact wording, but basically our, we're, we're always combating against our genes. Uh, but it seems to me that I'm better off if I act not so selfishly in certain circumstances, and if we can change the norms of the group, say the problem of the commons that you discuss in this view of life, uh, we're all better off. I guess what we're combating is that I don't personally act selfishly, and you do too, but you and I just simply agree, we're not gonna do that, we're gonna do this over here, and we each make a little sacrifice, but in the long run, we're better off. That just seems like the, uh, another strategy for survival. 
that that seems just as as real, you know, as part of our human nature as as the selfish component of our of our genetic propensities. Well, I think one reason why the the uh, the concept of a selfish gene has such intuitive appeal for some people is that it can take cooperative behaviors and make them seem selfish. So the selfish gene, the way it succeeds is by cooperating with other genes. And Dawkins famously said that he could have titled his book The Cooperative Gene. Except for cancer and myotic drive and stuff like that, I mean, most genes are selfish by being cooperative. And, uh, and it's always the case that uh, if something evolves, then it is more fit than what didn't evolve, all things considered. So anything that evolves is selfish as far as its lower level units are concerned, but, but that makes it so general that it becomes empty. So if you're selfish, if you like exploit members of your group some of the time, and at other times you're selfish by cooperating with other members of your group, then it's just like everything's selfish and what are we gonna, how are we gonna distinguish between um, uh, competition and, and, uh, and cooperation? So it's the case that, um, and, and the reason that's intuitive is because it's easy, and, and many people do it, is that they see, they see everything through the lens of their own self-interest. And so the way they justify cooperation for themselves is to say that if I cooperate, or if we do this, if we create this norm, then I'm going to benefit along with everyone else, and so therefore I'll do it. So they're seeing things through that individualistic uh, 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 lens. Uh, not everyone thinks of it that way. There's more than one way to think in this world. Uh, but I think the important question to ask is, is um, where, are the, where are the fitness differences? Are you benefiting yourself at the expense of members of your group or by cooperating with members of your, of your group? That's the real question that we need to we need to address. Yeah, and you and, and you have a long section, as I mentioned, on the problem, uh, the tragedy of the commons. Maybe walk us through that for people who are not familiar with it, and how in the real world these kinds of problems are are solved. Yeah. So thank you for uh, for uh, pointing to that part of the book. It's based on the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who is well known to some people but not others. I'm betting eighty percent of your listeners have not heard of her, even though she won the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. She did win the Nobel Prize in economics. 80% of economists hadn't heard of her. <laughs> so there's much to say about that. But um, uh, I think most people know about the tragedy of the commons, the idea that if everyone is drawing upon a common resource, then there's a temptation to take more than your share, and that results in uh, the over-exploitation of the resource. And the received wisdom was, was that tragedy will always occur unless you can privatize the resource or impose some kind of top-down regulation. And what Ostrom showed by actually studying common pool resource groups was that some of them, not all, were able to successfully manage their, their resources on their own, um, but only if they possess certain, what she called core design principles. So here we go again with special conditions are required. And I'll list these in just a minute. Uh, what I did with Lynn, uh, I was honored to collaborate with her for three years before her death, uh, was we generalized together the core design principles to show that they follow very fundamentally from an evolutionary uh, perspective. And for that reason, they apply not only to common pool resource groups, but to all groups. And so that chapter of my book is titled, What All Groups Need. And so... Here are the core design principles. I'm going to race through them, and then I'm going to make a point uh, about how these make sense from an evolutionary uh, perspective. So think about the groups in your life out there in, in um, Internet land, and uh, all you good skeptics, uh, keep a group in mind, any group, and ask yourself the question, will, that, will your group function better if they have these core design principles? And number one, a strong sense of identity and purpose. I know that this is my group. I know that I'm in it. I know who's in it and who's not. I know what it's supposed to do, and it's important to me. Those groups function well. Number two, uh, benefits proportional to cost. It's not sustainable for some members of the group to do all the work and for others to get all the benefits. So um, what you give has to be proportional to what you get. 
Number three, inclusive decision making. It's not sustainable, it's not gonna work if the decisions are made by some members of the group and other members are cut out of the decision making process. That's another recipe for unfairness. Number four, monitoring. Agreed upon behavior must be monitored. And if somebody's not doing what they should, something has to be done about it. You can't, you can't do that unless behavior is being monitored. Uh, number five, graduated sanctions. If somebody's not behaving as they should, then there has to be some sanctioning. Uh, but it need not be harsh at the beginning. In fact, it should start out friendly and mild. And most of us want to be solid citizens. And when we fail, a nice friendly reminder is enough. And yet, it must be possible to escalate in those cases where it's necessary. And also, there should be um, praise for good behavior in addition to punishment for for bad behavior. The golden rule is abundant praise for good behavior coupled with mild punishment for bad behavior that escalates when necessary. Number six, um, uh, fast and fair conflict resolution. Uh, conflicts will occur. They need to be resolved quickly in a matter that's respectful to all parties. Most people in a conflict think that they have a point of view and they want that point of view to be, to be uh, respected. Number seven, authority to self-govern. A group has to have elbow room in order to do these things, to manage their own affairs. If they're being dictated from, um, from the outside, then all bets are off. And it's for this reason that libertarians um, tend to think highly of uh, Eleanor uh, Ostrich. Mm -hmm. uh, number eight, appropriate relations with other groups. Um, uh, and those relations must embody the same uh, design principle. So this is a, an important point because it means that the core design principles are scale independent. They're needed for relations among groups just as much as for relations uh, within groups. So there they are. Much to say about them. I'm keeping it brief. Uh, but um, from an evolutionary perspective, we can see that uh, when you when you think that there's two ways to succeed, number one, at the expense of your group, and number two, as a team player, then in a group where the core design principles are strongly implemented, it's really hard to benefit at the expense of others within the same group. Mm -hmm. Basically, the potential for disruptive self-serving behaviors has been suppressed. And if you know a little bit about evolution, you know that's what allows a major transition to occur. A major transition of evolution takes place when the potential for disruptive self-serving behaviors within groups is suppressed so that between group selection becomes the dominant evolutionary force. This is how, how nucleated cells evolve from bacterial cells, multicellular organisms, social insect colonies, and all that. So a group that implements the core design principles has accomplished what you might say is a miniature cultural major transition which is suppressed self-serving behavior, disruptive self-serving behaviors. And so now everyone is free to behave um, for the good of the good of the group. Another way to think of it is that there's a strong moral system. The, uh, the group has implemented a strong moral system. And so this can now be used as a blueprint for the performance of groups, which we've done now. We now have developed a, a method based on this called pro-social, in which we coach groups in the core design principles and cause them to function better as groups. Now, to what extent does size and transparency matter for these core design principles? The smaller the group, it seems to me, the more transparent the transactions can be. And I can see that I'm not getting cheated or somebody's not trying to take advantage of the system. Whereas if you have like an international or a national health system or a national tax system, uh, there's too much opportunity for corruption and and, and bribery and so on, and I can't see that. I'm just one of 100 million people or whatever. Um, it seems to me that smaller and more transparent is more effective. What do you do when you scale up from a, a tribe to a group to a nation? Right, well, great question, and, um, and uh, I think there's a great answer to it. <laughs> so here's the great answer to your great question. Uh, yes, it's um, easier in small groups. We all know about Dunbar's number. We know, and I think a very important message Actually, this is a huge, huge um, message of this view of life, is that um, we evolved in the context of small groups. That's what our minds are adapted to do. Most, um, 
most uh, spontaneously. And that was like the one constant of our social environments. We lived in, you know, everything else varied, our, the climates, the ecological niches. But in all cases, our ancestors lived in small and for the most part, highly cooperative groups. When there was conflict, it was often between group conflict. So, you know, warfare has taken place forever. Um, but uh, mostly we were living in small cooperative uh, groups. That's, you might say, most instinctively, where we most instinctively implement these core design principles. Although I hasten to add, in modern life, even small groups can be deficient in these core design principles. Being a small group is no guarantee that you're going to implement these core design principles. Now, it's harder to implement them in large groups, but that doesn't mean that it's impossible. And if you look at the history, uh, human history over the last 10,000 years, this is based on the work of Peter Turchin and others, what you find is, is a process of actual cultural multi-level selection favoring those groups that did make it work at a larger scale um, compared the, uh, to those that don't. And what that required was then cultural constructions that, uh, that supplement our innate psychological abilities. So throughout history, all the way leading up to the present moment, what you can find is large units, such as large corporations or nations, which actually do manage to implement these core design principles better than others. So one example is Norway. And if you look at a comparison of nations, so books such as The Spirit Level, or Why Nations Fail, or uh, the work of Francis Fukuyama, um, then uh, the Scandinavian countries are always leading the pack in terms of quality of life and other uh, indices of, uh, of societal health. And we've made a study of this, a special study of Norway, and shown that uh, basically the reason that Norway works as well as it does is because it has managed to scale up these core design uh, principles. So uh, it's not as easy, but uh, can happen. And if you look at the corporate world, Michael, then I think that what you're seeing now with the rise of such things as, uh, as benefit corporations, uh, B Corps, are, um, are, are large companies that actually do want to do the right thing. And one reason is, is because there is more transparency. It's, it's not so easy for a company to actually do something unethical and get away from it, or get away with it. And if they're found out, such as Volkswagen, <laughs> uh, tampering with their emission standards, then the public is, is, is sufficiently outraged that it, it costs. Or you can take such things as the Me Too movement, which is an amazing thing when you think about it, that powerful men are now being held accountable for, uh, for uh, sexual uh, bullying. Uh, it's always gone on. But now something about it has made it more consequential if you don't. And then it's, it's the same dynamic that exists in small groups, but it is playing itself out on a larger scale. Well, it, the technology of the internet has really helped with that transparency issue. I'm reminded two days ago, the LAPD posted on Twitter a video of this massive guy down at 6th and Central, downtown LA, uh, just thumping these two women. I don't know what led to it, but they they got at it, these two young girls, and he just cold cocks each of them. Bam, down they go. I mean, they're out, and he runs off. And, and it was a high-def camera that somebody had posted, and uh, yesterday he turned himself in. They didn't arrest him. He just turned himself in because he realized, I can't go anywhere. Everybody in the world is now seeing this video. And so uh, well, I mean, the internet, the internet gives us the best and the worst. And this is a great example of a brave new world yeah. of, of communication. Now, a and, few other notes I made. Uh, I, w I was familiar with Lynn's work uh, because I, uh, I hang around with classical liberals and libertarians, the Reason Magazine guys and Cato Institute and so on. So they love her work because of this idea of Friedrich Hayek, spontaneous bottom up self-organization. And that, of course, their argument is you don't need top-down government regulation and controls because people will spontaneously sort themselves into order and solve these 
a tragedy of the commons type problems naturally. And they use examples like ranchers in California and miners in the West. Before the long arm of the law got out there, ranchers and miners established their own sets of rules and regulations and punishments and so on for violations. Uh, Pete Leeson uh, wrote that book, The, uh, the Invisible Hook, about yeah, pirates, not yeah. on it. Uh, pirates who you know spontaneously uh, constructed their own constitutions, and you know laggards and people that that don't take the risk do not get the benefits, and so on. The problem, uh, not the problem, just um, the, the examples you give are all positive, which is great because it's an uplifting book. But I just had um, dialogued with Rachel Kleinfeld for her new book called A Savage Order a savage order. And this is about what happens when states fail, when the central government collapses, like in the Republic of Georgia, Colombia, now in Venezuela. Um, there, there is indeed spontaneous order that erupts from below. They're called mafioso gangs. <laughs> and they have their rules and regulations, all right? And, uh, and if you don't obey them, you know, you're getting cement shoes and, and you know, rates of violence and corruption and bribery go up. These are not such good examples of spontaneous order. Um, absolutely. And I would never, I mean, I disagree with your libertarian friends, uh, by the way, and uh, I've made a long study of it. Uh, it's only briefly touched upon in my book, but uh, I've written a lot elsewhere on economics, Ebonomics, go to Ebonomics.com, and I have many, many articles along with many, many uh, others. So let me spend just a few uh, minutes on this. Basically, yeah. What I say in the book, and, and evolution doesn't make anything, everything nice. You, the book is uplifting and affirmative. But uh, not in a not in a false way. And the, the major message of the book is that unless we actually know what to do, then evolution will take us where we don't want to go. It will lead to these mafioso situations, and and uh, and uh, all that. So unless we actually um, know become wise managers of evolutionary processes, then uh, then um, it's a very bad prognosis uh, indeed. So what does that mean? So in the book, I say there's two things that don't work. And there's one thing that can work. One thing that won't work is laissez-faire. Sorry, libertarians, it ain't so. And when you when you think well of Eleanor Ostrom, that's just a little piece of the of the uh, of the uh, of the puzzle there. So laissez-faire, the idea that the pursuit of lower-level self-interest robustly benefits the common good. If multi-level selection tells us anything, is that that's not that's not um, uh, true. Selection at a given level. Adaptation at a given level requires selection at that level. So laissez-faire, absolutely not. The other thing that doesn't work is centralized planning. That doesn't work because systems are too complex for any group of experts to know what to do and to implement it. So the two major policy paradigms of laissez-faire and centralized planning, neither one can work. What can work, and that is a, um, a, a managed process of cultural evolution, basically. We're dealing with very complex systems. We have to implement, we have to have the welfare of the whole system in mind. That's absolutely critical. And then we have to implement our strategies in a way that's cautious and experimental. And basically what we're doing is we're employing variation and selection uh, and retention procedures. And there's good examples of this. I provide three examples in my, in my book. This actually has arisen. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has worked are people that have a systemic goal in mind. They're experimental in their approach. And, uh, and uh, um, that's the only thing that, that, uh, that can work and that we have to refine. Well, uh, you mean you need some central control. You need some top-down regulation of, say, an industry, a coal industry or the nuclear industry. Uh, in this case, the most famous example of the financial industry, uh, like in sports, even if most of the athletes don't want to cheat, if you think that everybody else is doing it, like the problem in my sport of doping and cycling, you know, then everybody's doping, even if the, most of them don't want to. They all really kind of want a central authority to come down and say, you're not doing this anymore, and here's how we're going to stop it. Totally, totally. One of the things I say in the book is forget about regulation the way economists talk about it. Think about regulations the way biologists talk about it. Think of all the processes that have to be regulated for a, 
um, organism. And what sports competition is not refereed for heavens? <laughs> but give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in fact, when they're not regulated properly, like when they didn't call the pass interference on the Rams against the New Orleans Saints, look what happened. Everybody wants more regulation. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's so, um, I mean, it's so obvious in retrospect. Another, I mean, a major theme of my book, as you know, is that the theory decides what you can observe. Nothing makes sense all by itself. It's always against the background of other beliefs. This brings us back to meaning systems. And so to adopt an evolutionary worldview literally gives you a new common sense. It causes you to see things and for things to make sense that, see, that were invisible before or that seemed wrong before. And, and so that brings us back to the idea of, of evolution as a not just a theory that tells us what is, but a worldview that tells us what we ought to do about such things as raising our children, our, our individual mental and physical health and uh, our groups of all sorts and our large scale societies. So really the most important thing to do is to, is to see the world through this new, for many people, new lens. Um, and at that point then, along with Thomas Huxley, we can say, how stupid of us not to have thought of that. That's a great, and you ended the book with that. I love, absolutely love that ending. Um, so a few other thoughts I had when I was reading um, the book, you, again, it's uplifting that, you know, groups can be very powerful in a positive way, but uh, I also brought to mind uh, Paul Bloom's book, Against Empathy, where he makes the point that, if anything, super groupishness, where there's a, 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 an increase in empathy within the group, can make you very xenophobic and tribal against other groups. And, and, and now, since he wrote that book, you know, we have Trump and the rise of nationalism and, and, um, and populism and, and this kind of, you know, conflict between groups. Like we have to have a trade war so that we have a favorable balance of trade against those Chinese because they're ripping us off. That does seem to be kind of a dark side of groupishness nationalism in particular. Of course, of course. And uh, if I can just say one reason why I, I like to go beyond debates about religion is that when, when the focus becomes religion, then it almost seems as if like religious groups are the only ones that engage in between group conflict, which of course is not true. So, um, so uh, yeah, there's a dark side to uh, groupishness. But if you look, first as a biologist, ask the question, what are all the different relationships among species? And they span the range from highly negative predation, parasitism, competition, to highly positive uh, mutualism, uh, species that can't get along without other species. And then in the middle, there's just commensalism and, and coexisting without interacting at all. Now, if you ask the question, what are the relationships among human groups? It's the same spectrum. Everything from predatory, competitive, parasitic, all the way to mutualistic or coexisting without interacting. So it's not true that to be groupish requires hostile between group interactions. It depends for the most part on the ecological context. The groups will cooperate or not for the same reason that individuals will cooperate or not. And here we get to the scale and dependence of those core design principles. So if you want to put an end to between group conflict, what you have to do is you have to attend to the ecology of the situation and try to configure things so that aggressive strategies don't work, don't pay, and, and cooperative strategies do pay. But one of the, I would say, the important, most important message of multi-level selection is that uh, I'll state it in, in science talk first and then I'll unpack it, that adaptation at any level of a multi-tier hierarchy requires a process of selection at that level and tends to undermine adaptation at higher levels. In other words, what's good for me can be bad for my family. What's good for my family can be bad for my clan. What's good for my clan can be bad for my nation. What's good for my Corporation can be bad for the global economy. What's good for my nation can be bad for the global village. And so whenever you're trying to um, increase the functionality of, a, of, of any social 
unit, let us say a nation, then you're going to be creating problems up the scale. And so the only solution to that is to formulate policy with the welfare of the highest unit in mind. In other words, a whole earth ethic, that we have to formulate our policy with the welfare of the whole earth in mind. That doesn't mean that the lower level units are subordinated or go away because those benefits of the global scale have to be distributed all the way up and down the um, nested hierarchy of units, all the way down to the lower units, the groups, the families, the, uh, so on and so on and so forth. But if we're not actually formulating our policies with the welfare of the whole earth in mind, we will create problems. That's very powerful. Let's take two examples from current events, uh, immigration, borders, you know, we live in a, a world of nation states, which is only a, a few centuries old as a concept. To me, I would like to foresee the day when there are no more political borders or economic borders and, and, and markets decide things or, you know, Mexicans come to California because there's great work or at some point there's no more work because the market's flooded so they don't come to California, you know, but that's not the world we live in. And so conservatives would counter your argument and say, uh, something like, well, borders are good because we have certain values in, in our group, and these are the values we cherish, and as you know from Trump's opening speech, he, you know, they're bringing rapists and, and, and criminals and drug dealers across our border into our group. We've got to protect our group. How, how does a evolutionary biologist address that kind of issue, you in particular, I mean? Well, in the first place, we can, we can label it as a blatant adaptive fiction, as we always have. I mean, as we know, that it's not the case that immigrants are statistically rapists and so on. And right. So, and so there is, you know, um, uh, outrageous falsehoods yep. that are in support of that, um, of that ideology. I think it's, a, it's so unfortunate that what we think of as globalism uh, is of the neoliberal variety. And so now, since neoliberal economic policies have been in place for um, 50 years or so, uh, then they have generated just tremendous inequality at all, at all scales. If that's what globalization means, then it doesn't deserve to mm -hmm. persist. We need a different kind of, of, uh, of globalization. And so it's because of these inequities I think that people have more or less thumbed their nose at the idea of such things as the European Union and, and so on, adopted smaller national identities because those identities are not sharing the benefits. Mm. So it's, it, you can sympathize with them to an extent, but at the same time, to retreat to nationalism is no solution at all. No right. solution at all. And so we have to envision a different kind of global cooperation which is much more attentive to equity and if you go back to those core design principles you know they're all about equity mm -hmm. uh, fairness within groups so equity is baked in to the core design principles and what's needed then is to expand that outward and to then get governance at larger and larger scales which also represent the core design uh, 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 principles. Uh, and how would you address the problem of North Korea and nuclear weapons? How do you tell Kim Jong Un he can't have nuclear weapons, but we can? Well, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on every policy issue, uh, but I do think that there is, uh, if you look at um, uh, international relations through the lens of, uh, you get so much insight by taking these large-scale problems and shrinking them down to see what they would look like in a smaller group. Individuals in a smaller group compared to nations, for example, in a, um, um, on, a global, on a global stage. If each nation was an individual, then the world would be a group with about 195 individuals in it. But how are they behaving towards uh, each other? And then you see such massive failures of cooperation and, and long, long histories of just blatant aggression and exploitation and so on and so forth, that um, these things in the long view have to be, 
have to be corrected. We have to establish cooperative relations among of, of the sort that's never existed mm-hmm. uh, uh, before. And there has to be acknowledgement of just such terrible things that have happened in the in the past. What is the justification for one nation to have all the power and other nations not to? We're uh, the good guys. <laughs> we would never use nuclear weapons. Oh, wait, we're the only ones that ever did. Uh, <laughs> but never again. <laughs> well, yes, of course. You're holding yourself accountable, and you know that um, the wonderful literature on, on uh, hunter-gatherer societies, there's inequalities there, too. There's you know, individuals that are stronger and better hunters and, and, um, and so on and so forth. But if you're a good hunter-gatherer, then uh, you don't flaunt that. You don't throw it around. You don't bully it. You basically you subordinate yourself to the, uh, to the group. And that's something that uh, religions, uh, the Axial Age religions, uh, Peter Turchin tells this story, well, uh, they don't get credit for keeping the peace as well as they, uh, as well as they, um, as they do. And, and as well as I have historically, basically. Uh, let me see what other notes I had here. Um, yeah, let's just talk a little bit of in, inside baseball for a moment about, about group selection. Now, to me, it doesn't really matter whether uh, what, what's the famous line from um, George Williams noted a fleet herd of deer is really just a herd of fleet deer. Now, I don't really care which what words we how we describe a group, but here I'm reading now um, Pink, uh, Steve Pinker's cr- critique of group selection, which he rejects. As you know, most evolutionary biologists have rejected group selection, uh, but now it's made something of a comeback in the last 20 years or so, thanks in part to your and Elliot Sober's work, and now Ed Wilson. Uh, but let me just read a portion of what Steve says about this. The theory of natural selection applies most readily to genes because they have the right stuff to drive selection, namely making high fidelity copies of themselves. It's the genes themselves that are replicated over generations and are thus the targets of selection and the ultimate beneficiaries of adaptations. What about groups? Natural selection could legitimately apply to groups if they met certain conditions. The groups made copies of themselves by budding or fissioning. The descendants groups, descendant groups faithfully reproduce traits of the parent group, which cannot be reduced to the traits of their individual members, except for mutations that were blind to their costs and benefits to the group. And groups competed with one another for representation in a meta population of groups. So maybe address that um, critique. In what way is um, a tribe or a nation or a religion or whatever a group in the same way, a, 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 a selective mechanism like a gene is? Right. Um, <clears throat> I respect my colleague Steve Pinker in some ways, especially at the things he's been trained to do. But uh, reading that essay and that statement is like listening to Rip Van Winkle wake up after decades of uh, things that he's not familiar <laughs> with. So uh, so what he's saying there uh, is a very familiar argument to selfish gene fans. Basically, genes are replicators. And uh, genes are the only uh, replicators. But the thing that you know about, must know about selfish gene theory is that uh, it has two concepts, the replicators and vehicles. Vehicles. Individuals aren't replicators, but they are vehicles. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to explaining why individuals are the functionally organized unit, it's not based on the fact that they're replicators. It's based on the fact that they're vehicles. If we want to ask the same question about groups, we have to ask, in some sense, can groups be vehicles in the same way that individuals are? That's the question you need to ask. Mm -hmm. And so when, when Dawkins originally... And Steve Pinker, waking up, Rip Van Winkle-like, says it's all about replicators. He's not even identifying the concept that's required in order to ask the question. It's a vehicle question, Steve. It's a vehicle question. At least get that far, will you? Now, I'll calm down. (laughs) (laughs) And here's, uh, and it's at this point that, um, uh, here's another way to get at the the question. that um, that goes all the way back to to Darwin. So 
Originally, Darwin thought that his theory could explain all aspects of design that had been attributed to a creator. But gradually he realized that actually that wasn't the case and that all of the traits associated with uh, prosociality, social adaptations, um, everything that's associated with human morality, altruism, bravery, loyalty, honesty, all of these things are actually disadvantageous, selectively disadvantageous compared to more selfish traits within the same group. All of these virtuous traits are vulnerable to more self-serving traits. And so he was faced with the question, how can these virtuous traits evolve? And group selection is what he had to add to his theory of natural selection in order to explain these traits, which are selectively disadvantageous within each and every group. Now, when we go to a modern context, and it doesn't matter what the name of the theory is, call it kin selection, selfish gene theory, group selection, does not matter. Evolutionary game theory, take the trait that it is identified as cooperative or altruistic or pro-social. Identify the group in which social interactions occur. Compare the fitness with a more selfish alternative trait within that group. And you will discover what Darwin discovered is that the cooperative trait is not most fit within that group. Therefore, something must be added. And that something is invariably groups doing better than other groups in some multi-group population. Call it vehicles, call it units, call it whatever you like, call it the N of N person game theory, whatever it is, that dynamic is true for all theories of social evolution. But what, why do we need another group? Just me acting within my group, I want to be selfish, but the group itself has norms that, that, that attenuate my selfishness and encourage me uh, to be more cooperative, and so I do. It's still just me, an uh, individual, uh, selfish, moral agent, acting to my best benefit by being nice and cooperative just within the group, whether there's other groups or not. Yeah, but the only reason you did is that, uh, that uh, there were other people in the group that were prepared to punish you. Yeah, that's just still individual natural selection, is it not? No, it's not. And so let's just dwell on this because I think it's a great example. So when we talk about this, we're actually talking about the evolution of two traits, not one. One is, are you going to be an altruistic or not? And the second one is, are you going to punish cheaters or not? Okay. And so if there's enough punishers in the group, then the altruists do better than the cheaters because the cheaters are punished. But how about the punishers compared to the non-punishers? If you're a non-punisher in the group, or if you're a punisher, then you're going to some time, effort, expense in order to keep the peace. And the non-punisher in the same group is going to benefit from that. So the non-punisher is more fit than the punisher. This is called a second order public good. There's many, many models. And so as soon as you start thinking about, if you just think about the altruistic selfishness problem as a single trade, then it's clear selfishness beats altruism within groups. If you had punishment, social control, then it's, you solve that first problem, but only by substituting a second problem with the same, of the same kind. The whole social control system is one which requires time, energy, and, and risk compared to those that don't, don't do it. So that problem never goes away. And there's a big literature on this. So uh, it's one of the things that frustrates me and caused me to lose my temper to uh, Steve Pinker, who I'll be seeing in a few months at a conference in, uh, in uh, um, Italy, is that really this should become known. I mean, the, the idea that this is still controversial at this point has just, um, it shouldn't well, I, be. I wonder if it's just the language that's being used because the, the way groups are used, it's almost like, uh, you, you know, remember Dan Dennett's analogy between sky hooks and, and cranes. You know, evolution works by just cranes building the building from the bottom up, and then people try to sneak in a sky hook, you know, and then the intelligent designer added the eyes or added the moral sense or, or, or whatever, and, and we can't sneak in any sky hooks. It, it, it almost feels to me like when you use this word group, like it's, well, you, you open up with, with TLR Deschardins, 
he kind of had this sort of mystical sense that there's this global new sphere, this global consciousness. That to me feels like a skyhook that's being dropped in to the system. So when, sometimes when the word group is used, it's almost like it's this meta something supernatural larger thing that exists separate from you and I in, as vehicles. Well, I want to push back on that, uh, yeah. Michael, in the following way, and this is what's so interesting. And it gets us back to William's distinction between a, um, a herd of fleet deer or a fleet herd of deer, which is actually a very, very important distinction. So let's say, think of fleetness as just an individual trait. You're either fleet or not. And fleetness is good, so fleetness is going to evolve no matter how you group them, no matter how you group them. Uh, nevertheless, if you did group them so that all the fleet deer were in one herd and all of the slow deer were in another herd, that would, have, that would appear to be a difference between groups. Williams wants you to know that it's not. It's just a matter of fleetness at the individual level. Okay, So that distinction is actually a very important distinction to make. But as soon as we start to consider social behaviors in which your fitness is not just based on your property, it's also based on the other individuals with whom you interact, okay? And altruism and selfishness is like this. If you're an altruist, I can't calculate your fitness on that basis. I need to know who you're interacting with. If you're an altruist interacting with other altruists, your fitness will be this. If you're an altruist interacting with selfish, your fitness will be that. And so I can't even calculate your fitness as an individual without knowing your social partners, okay? Okay. And those social partners is your group. Right. That's, that's why, that's why there's the, 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 defini the definition of a group is not fuzzy at all. It's something that you actually have to determine accurately in order to calculate the fitness of an individual when we're talking about the evolution of social behaviors. So when you take something like evolutionary game theory, it's called n-person game theory. What does that mean? n is the number of individuals that are interacting with each other. When n, when n equals 2, we get this outcome. When n equals 3, 5, 10, 20, 1,000, we get that outcome. But you got to specify that value of n or else you won't be able to even build your model. Mm -hmm. So there's much more unity in the concept of group than you would think. It's not fuzzy and it's not arbitrary. It's what is the set of individuals that are determining each other's fitness. And you've got to know about it just to build an evolutionary model, no matter what that model is called. Now, why do groups still contain, say, 1% to 3% psychopaths? How come we didn't evolve out, punish, and get rid of all the, the cheaters and free, free riders and so on? Well, uh, that's a great question with a great answer. <laughs> and uh, once, you, once we begin to think, this is another case of the theory deciding what we can observe. The logic of multi-level selection is is very intuitive once you get used to it. Um, you look inside groups and you see what's the fitness difference there, then you go up and you look at the fitness difference between groups and so on and so forth. And what that shows is, of course, is that um, um, this balance between levels of selection can result in, in many outcomes. Um, it could result in, in um, selfishness winning and everyone being 100% selfish, um, altruism winning and everyone being 100% altruism, or some mix in between. The equilibrium could be some percentage of selfish and altruistic individuals. And in the case of psychopathy, um, it's a plausible scenario that when psychopaths are at a very low frequency, uh, then uh, basically everyone's dropped their defenses and so that they can uh, do well. But after they get above a critical frequency, then people become more defensive and then they get uh, held down to that low level. So this is a, a certain kind of frequency dependent selection, uh, which is maintaining a mix in the population. But let me give you a real world example of that, because you know, we're, all this seems so theoretical. There's plenty of studies. And my, um, let me give you two, if I may, uh, just to show you that this is not just uh, a theoretical. One is my former uh, grad student, Omar Eldekar, worked on Water striders, are the, those are the in insects that skate on the surface of water where they scavenge for, for um, um, a prey, insects that have fallen on the surface of the water. Turns out the males differ 
uh, greatly in their aggressiveness towards females. So actually, some males are psychopaths. <laughs> <laughs> They're just predatory. They hunt for females, and then they attempt to rape them. Other males are more docile. They're gentlemen who wait to be asked to do their manly duty. And this is a very stable individual difference. And so Omar created pools of water of six males and six females in each pool. And he altered the frequency of males from 100% psychopaths to 100% docile and various mixes in between. So what did he find? He found within every pool containing both types, the psychopaths did better than the docile males. No mm. surprise. Bad boys get the girls. <laughs> in every pool, there was not a single pool mm. in which the docile males had an advantage over. So psychopathy beats docility within groups. On the other hand, in the groups with the psychopaths, the females were so terrorized that they didn't get a chance to eat. Mm -hmm. and therefore I didn't lay many eggs. And so the, so the groups with the docile males had two to three times more eggs laid than in the groups with the psychopathic males. So now altruistic groups beat selfish groups. So um, now an interesting question is, what generates variation among groups? You have to have variation among groups. He created that variation in that experiment, but what creates variation in nature? And so he did a second experiment in which he interconnected the groups. So now all the insects were capable to come and go in those groups however they wanted. And so what happens is, is females enter a pool where there's a psychopath. Guess what? She leaves as soon as she possibly can. Now the psychopath is free to follow. Everyone can move. But when the whole thing settles down and equilibrates, there is an impressive degree of clustering of the females around the docile males. Hmm. And so it's movement, conditional movement, that's generating the variation among groups. It's not kin selection. These individuals are not genealogically related to each other. It's a form of partner choice, basically. So there is a real world example of, um, and it results in a mix, basically, um, a mix of individuals, not just one or the other. I could give other examples, but that one's probably good enough to show you that this actually well, does take place in nature. Well, let's apply it to humans and, and see if you'd care to wade in on the gender differences debate and masculinity versus toxic masculinity and and uh, to what extent men should be, you know, men's men, you know, Jordan Peterson like, you know, you know, get get your life in order and, and grow a spine and stand up for yourself and versus what we clearly have recognized through the Me Too movement, there are toxic males. There are males that are just badass, really asshole, jerks, psychopaths or whatever. Um, what, what, you, you, there's toxic, there's toxic yeah. females too. Can we talk about toxic people? <laughs> yes, that's right. There are toxic people. Well, it's interesting, um, you, you know, the, the broader perspective here, just to kind of pull back since we, we've been going over an hour and a half here on on your on your book, that um, it seems to me evolutionary psychology and the approach you, you take in this book is a pretty gentle, positive one. But evolutionary psych, as you know, and sociobiology as well, has kind of got a bad rap. On both the left and the right, it seems like uh, you know you have cognitive creationists on the left and, and regular creationists on the right, and and the, this fear of genetic determinism and the idea that men and women could be biologically different implies that you, you know that any kind of differences in the corporate world are are just genetic and it's always going to be that way. You, you sort of see why people this this kind of thinking makes people nervous. Make the case for this view of life as not being uh, of that sort. Well, I think we need to be mindful of the uh, science is becoming a, a, a basis of authority uh, for maintaining meaning system uh, in a way that departs from factual reality in its own way. And you only have to go back, you know, so far to the Victorian age, for example, or yeah, actually much sooner than that, before we see beliefs that were said to be supported by science Turns out not so. They were reinforcing cultural uh, uh, beliefs and, and power structure. I mean, my wife um, uh, 
I mean, so when 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 my wife and I were younger, you know, in our in our in our twenties and so on, um, the belief was that women's bodies were too frail to run marathons. Women were not allowed to run marathons because it was said that their bodies would fall uh, apart, and that was said to be received scientific wisdom. The idea that women are mentally inferior, so on and so forth, all all scientifically validated or so it so it seemed and i think that uh nobody including scientists gets away from this tendency because it is the way our minds are constructed to assemble beliefs that reinforce the way we think that we should be um uh, acting and so we need to be vigilant against sort of uh, stealth religions as i as i as i call them there are no gods anywhere no supernatural agents and we've restricted ourselves to what seem to be the facts of the world, but we're building them into structures that actually privilege us or, or so on. So a lot of vigilance is, uh, is, uh, is called for. Uh, and so it's against that background that I think that we have some of the problems that we're, that we're uh, talking about on both the left and the right. So I think there's versions of VP that are biased in that way and versions of postmodernism and social constructivism that are biased the other way uh, it's uh, it's a tough thing to uh, to uh, 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 to negotiate we do the best we can and I think scientists are are not immune from that it's not they don't they don't leave that so what is your opinion, what is your opinion on this the, the current one that say James Damore got fired from Google for saying that that the reason there aren't more female programmers is not because there's um, uh, institutional bias in, at, at the company, Google Alphabet, but in fact, women don't like to program because it's more of a guy thing. It's a thing to do, and, and boys just naturally, because of testosterone or whatever, you know, gravitate toward things, and, and girls gravitate toward people, so you have more medical doctors and psychologists and teachers uh, that are women, but you get more techie uh, jobs that, 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 that are uh, populated by men. Is that going to be one of these things that ends up being a complete myth that it's in 25 years we're going to look back at this and go oh my god look the equivalent of women can't run marathons or might this be one that holds up it could be i mean one thing to say is that it's a theoretical possibility it's not absurd there's a rationale uh behind it and so it should be something that you're allowed to say and that it's um and uh, certainly you should be allowed to do theoretical uh, scientific um uh, uh, inquiry on it and yet we should also be um, um, mindful of the consequences of accepting it too early especially given the history of exclusion and so on and and so forth and we do have examples i mean much the same thing could be said for musical ability and we do have these great examples that as soon as they held auditions up behind screens mm -hmm. and they took care for example they even had to take their shoes off because if you heard the clickety click of high heels then <laughs> <laughs> your implicit bias would would uh, mm -hmm. uh, would kick in. We do have good examples like that. I don't think anyone could have predicted that currently how well women are doing compared to men in college. I mean, really. Right. And now it's the men that are struggling, right. uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, I think that the challenge is is that um, is that when we look at uh, the way we think about maleness and femaleness. There is a huge biological component, and there is a huge socially constructed uh, component, and we have to hold both of those in our heads. That's what's so hard to do: is people tend to gravitate and choose one or the other. And let me just give you an example. It was impactful for me. It was an essay called um, "A Punk Song." I don't remember the author, but he was a pacifist who went to jail for principled reasons. And he got turned out as a punk, which means that uh, basically his choice was to be either gang raped all the time or to come under the protection of a strong man in prison. And this was not a matter of homosexuality. Uh, that's one of the things you learn and one of the things he said, and this has been true throughout history, 
is that is that homosexuality, for example, in Greek times or Roman time, was all about power. Who has the power to penetrate anybody? Mm-hmm. Not about gender. So so these men in prison, the tough ones, basically they take on um, other men as their as their mates because it's what's available. When they go on the outside, they'll resume their heterosexual lies, or maybe a mix of of both. But anyhow, this poor man became a punk and developed the traits that we associate with femininity. And why is that? It's because he was powerless. And the only way he could actually get his way were through these other wiles, which we recognize as feminine. So when feminists say it's all about power, well, it's not all about power, but hell of a lot about power. And another fascinating point to make, Michael, and I don't think people appreciate this well, but let me, maybe we should end on this point because we'll go on forever if we don't. But you know, as a biologist, that a trait is conservative if all of the species in a lineage have the same trait. And a trait is labile when the, when it varies among species that are closely related to, uh, uh, to each other. And against that background, if you look at, at social systems and sexual differences in the great apes, it is incredibly labile. Hmm. I mean, it's everything from monogamy to, uh, to harems to chimps, which is sort of a male-dominated society, to bono, bonobos, which is a female-dominated um, society. This is telling you that the fact that you're a great ape isn't saying anything about your sexual and social system. It's so flexible that when a new way to do things became advantageous, then that's what happened and then genetic evolution followed suit. So that means that nothing is set in stone. And the idea that, that, that you know, the way we are now is sort of set in stone, I think, is um, um, always going to be true to a degree for any evolutionary process, but also capable of, of, uh, of changing. And against that background, when you get really good authors like Richard Wrangham and Mel Connor, mm-hmm. both of whom have written books about maleness and, and, and femaleness, and they say such things as, you know, demonic, males Mm -hmm. at least part of being males in the past was about raising hell and so that is imprinted in some sense it might be culturally imprinted it might be genetically imprinted in some but not others it might be imprinted by virtue of your personal upbringing but either way you cut it raising hell is something that we actually don't want to happen and the fact that that's you know something about your maleness well i'm sorry you still shouldn't do it and we should be taking steps to help you or to and if you just can't help yourself then we're going to lock you up and that's what self-domestication is we have this whole uh, Richard Wrangham's newest book is about how we just executed the people that couldn't help themselves that's how that's how why we're as cooperative as we are Right. I read uh, Christopher Baum's book a few years ago where he talks about how hunter-gatherers deal with psychopaths, bullies, free riders, or whatever, you know. Rangham Rangham is further developing Baum's thesis. Yeah. Well, this, you know, description of when they would take somebody out (laughs) behind the shed, so to speak, and and off them, this is not easy to do when you don't have guns, right? So they would have to cooperatively, like, okay, let's get six of us, and we'll gang up on this guy, and you shoot him, you hit him, and so on. And if if he's a big bully... that's actually hard to kill somebody like that. And, uh, but in, in a way, if we, so there's toxic masculinity, the kind you just described that, that we want to get rid of. But on, on the other hand, there's always going to be these 1% to 3% psychopaths, bullies. We're never going to get rid of all of them. So it's good to have strong men. This is the counter, the kind of conservative Jordan Peterson counter to the good kind of masculinity where you do want strong men to fight back against the bullies uh, and stand up and protect our group or protect our women or whatever. Um, it, you know, you don't want to get rid of that, right? Uh, definitely. Punishment is needed. That's the, uh, 
uh, graduated sanctions, basically. Uh, you, yeah. have to, you have to police good behavior. Absolutely essential. Whether that has to be big, strong men or whether it has to be, or whether it can be uh, something else, then... Um, well, as we've seen in the Me Too movement, there's plenty of women that are very strong and willing to stand up, particularly if they have the backing of other women or society or now really what what we're seeing i think is society coming around and saying yes stand up and organize and fight back and let's call out these you know the the ceos and the hollywood directors that have been getting away with this in a way there's there's some power in the numbers of people behind you that gives you the strength to then go ahead and stand up but they had the strength that was in there to come out if you have somebody uh that's got your back and so when I was studying religion more, in my, writing my book, Darwin's Cathedral, and made a special study of Calvinism and how these elements of religion work, what I discovered was, was that the turn the other cheek, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Uh, the real message of that was uh, leave the social control to us, please. And that if you have, you know, your petty grievances and stuff like that, no, you should be, you should be forgiving. But the, the reason you can be forgiving is that the church is going to be a much better social control than, mm. than uh, you are. And that's why we get these differences. You're familiar with, Michael, about uh, um, uh, Dick Nisbet's great work on, uh, on cultures of honor and so on, that mm. in agricultural societies, uh, basically the social control becomes a state affair. Uh, but in herding societies and so on, then the social control is something you have to do uh, yourself. And at that point, you have to defend your own uh, honor. And so the role of you know, traditional masculinity, I think, is uh, something, in the first place, we should have a great open discussion about it. Uh, uh, it should be free inquiry and, and so on, attending to, to differences. And, uh, but in the second place, we're capable of changing. And I think that uh, uh, even when it's, even when it's uh, difficult, Time and yeah. circumstances can cause for change. Maybe we need to have new ideas about masculinity. Uh, so on, you know, stay-at-home dads, not such a bad thing, and, and so on. Why, why am I not a man by, by electing to, to, uh, uh, to do that? And so I, I love, I have a little two and a half year old now and I love being, spending time at home with him. It's great. I'd rather do that than be a, a masculine, a hyper masculine CEO. I mean, those guys got to work 80 hours a week. They have no life outside of this. You know, I don't, I don't know why that's gotten elevated to being a great thing. I don't want to make that. Uh, it'd be nice to have the money without having to do the 80 hours a week, but I'd rather sacrifice that. So, but I think one to kind of wrap it up, I, I, I think one element of, triggering social change is the dispersal of good ideas, which is what you and I as authors try to do. I, I do hope your book does well in, in that sense. If nothing else, not just descriptive, but, 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 but maybe prescriptive or a actively prescribing to change things. This view of life, completing the Darwinian revolution. Congratulations, David. Uh, I hope the book does well for you and whatever you've got next uh, planned. One of the things I liked about the book is that it describes all the things you actually did. You're not just an egghead sitting in your office coming up with ideas. You actually go out and test them in the real world, which we need more of. So maybe someone in the State Department, and when they read the book, they'll hire you to come in and advise them on how to deal with immigration or North Korea or whatever, because we need more scientific uh, perspectives on those things. Well, that's actually starting to happen. I mean, this is uh, uh, going in the direction of policy. And it's all about catalysis, basically, making this happen, completing the Darwinian revolution in a matter of years, not decades, please. Right.